soon, man. Like I got to get a, a mic and like a boom arm. Cause you know, we're evolving. Right. So, yeah. So like, that's, that's something I'm, I'm sort of researching now. Um, just cause like, you know, I, I see it being a more useful thing, but pre pandemic, you know, like this was as much as I was doing. So yeah. it actually works really well as like a, like there's like a built in mic that sounds pretty good. So yeah, it does. Yeah. Are you, are you running, um, Mac? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The RPG stuff's pretty good as far as I know. Yeah. I just got a new interface, but I haven't set everything up yet. So I, I made the move to universal audio. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, no, man, I've been using this one for like a few years. So it's been great. You know, you just plug bass straight in. Uh, sometimes I'll use a preamp beforehand, you know? So I have like the, there's a thing that Carrie Nordstrand built called the star lifter. And oh, yeah. um, that thing's really good. I really like that. I, then there's like the tone hammer, which I've had for years. That's a really good thing. Have you ever um, used uh, Noble? Not yet. I, I want to check it out. I know all the cool kids <laughs> use the Noble, but I also know people that don't. I think I'd like to just try one and see what what it does for what I'm into yeah. doing. But I think I think for for most people who play bass, like even if your style is different or you like a variety of tones, like there's a fundamental thing people like to hear in their sound. And so I think that's what's probably people that's probably why people like the noble because well from what i've heard that's the thing like it's you know what i mean like there's there's a universal approach to tone that i think that's that's what people are responding to so sure. unless you're bunny burnell <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i don't really know <laughs> yeah i don't know but, but i think even for that style you know like having having like some of that up front i mean yeah. it can only help you know i don't know but yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. You know, it's, it's hard to, uh, I don't have, you know, like I have, a, I have my thing pretty dialed in, but now that I've got this new ecosystem of stuff with these uh, UAD plugins and stuff mm-hmm. like that, I mean, I don't know. It's like, I've always been really interested in production. And I think because of home uh, studio stuff being more, um, just it, it's gotten more accessible over the years. Like, you know, I've, I've had a setup for almost 20 years, you know? And I think now that it's just such a commonplace thing, I, I think, you know, it's just something that is a natural evolution for a lot of us as bass players and being in a world now, or which we've been in, you know, for a long time where you can do a lot of stuff from home, you know, yeah. like for, for people that are making albums that aren't, nearby you know like i i love doing that kind of stuff and you know like i always end up saying it's only bass <laughs> right yeah 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 no I, like my friend uh i don't know if you know this bass player matt rubano he's like one of my best friends and he he was in this band called taking back sunday um but matt's a really versatile bass player like he he played on lauren hill's record and stuff but like he was tell he was talking to somebody about like why he chose bass and and Matt's a real consummate bass player. So the person said, it's like, you took the easiest instrument and made it the hardest thing ever. <laughs> and I feel, <laughs> I feel like sometimes that's the, that's the weird pursuit, you know, um, even yeah. though well, it's yeah. like, you know, bass is one of those things that we spend so much time when we're practicing or whatever at home, like we spend so much time hearing it in isolation when it it's kind of, designed to be heard in context so we make right. a lot of choices in terms of maybe what we're playing and tonal choices based on that isolation and then you start to record or you, you go and rehearse with your band and you're like mm, this isn't quite happening <laughs> right um, yeah it's it's weird i think a lot of us i know for me a lot of my tonal ideas were informed from being a live musician you know So there was a phase where I was playing, like my main bass was a modulus for a while, you know, and those are really clear instruments. But if you're playing in a room that's not really the most bass guitar friendly room, like I don't mean in terms of the frequency bass, but 
you know, like something will get lost between where the band is set up and where the very back of the room is like, you know, your notes don't have the definition that they sound like they have when you're on stage. The modulus is like a very, um, it's a very extreme reaction to that kind of, uh, that kind of thing, you know, and it, it speaks in a way that's very clear, but when you take that out of that context and you put it in an isolated recording thing, it's like, Oh wait, there's all this, it's all this stuff now that like, yeah, I don't like, hear when I'm playing like, live, but yeah, it's like a, like a, a laser beam for live, but you don't yeah. really want that in the studio or. Yeah. I think there's a happy medium with that stuff. Like I really like, um, I don't know, man, like I like brighter sounds, but, and I think you can, you can make a case for it, depending on like what you're going to do. If you're going to put overdrive on the sound, if you're going to put distortion on it and it sort of uses that to help the um, overtones speak a little bit more but um yeah i think there's some things like that definitely i think some of those things make make recordings easier to manage because if you have something that has like a lot of stuff you can easily cut all that in the production process yeah exactly if, it, if it's not if you know if you have your tone rolled all the way off you can't really mm -hmm. add it afterwards yeah. but you can kind of you can kind of re replicate it in the mix yeah Exactly. Like, it's like when you hear some of those um, isolated bass track recordings. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one that kind of springs to mind um, is um, some of the bass tracks for like Rush. Yeah. When you hear that bass, you're like, it just sounds so bizarre. Like, it's not really, it, it, not really a, a natural choice you'd maybe make but then when you hear it in the context of everything else it's just been sculpted to perfectly fill that spectrum yeah i you know i love his sound and i think that's where i started to understand that like having levels of overdrive and compression even if you don't really notice the overdrive to the point when you're listening to it you know there's like so many other sounds that are kind of going along with the bass guitar sound so like on a song like Tom Sawyer, you've got like the Moog Taurus pedals, right? You like you've got that giant droning E and then, you know, the bass guitar doesn't sound very saturated next to that. But when you take it out of the mix and you just listen, it's like, wow, there's there's some stuff happening with with his sound that uh, that definitely works. But yeah. I don't know. I feel like we're in the golden age of distortion for bass, you know? I mean, yeah, d dark glass kind of happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, like I, I just did a couple recordings where I used, I used my dark glass stuff, and uh, it it really, even in a subtle way, it just really added the right amount of everything. It's that that uh, what do you call it, man? Um, the um, kind of distortion is it? Sorry, man. It's like the um, end of the day, uh, like the harmonic distortion. Harmonic distortion, multi-band, multi-band distortion, where, you know, you're taking certain frequencies and you're distorting those, but it's keeping the low in there, you know? Right. Um, yeah, it's it's such a cool sound, you know? Is that the, um, is that the, microtu the microtubes, uh, or the, B the B7K? Yeah, I have the X7, and X7. then I have, I have the B3K. Doug actually gave that to me at a NAMM show. Like in 2015, he just handed it to me. He's like, here, man, this is for you. I'm like, oh, shit. Cool. Um, and it's one of the older, it's kind of old now. Like I, they kind of change their designs every couple of years or they'll just kind of subtly do a refresh. So this one has like slightly different. It's not as like sci-fi looking. The logo is a little bit more homegrown, but it's, yeah, yeah. I still use that pedal to this day. I, I love how how simple it is. Yeah, um, it seems like it seems like every other month there's like a new variation of the dark glass pedal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in their in their plugin, the stuff they do with plugins, like the parallax, the thing they do with neural DSP. Yeah, and then um, even the stuff they do um, with they had like versions of the B uh, B seven K, and then like the micro tubes. Um, before uh, Parallax came out, it's really good, and I don't, I don't really have a deal with them, so I'm just you know, like I bought my X7 yep. um, before I went out on the road, and and so you know I'd love to work with them, but no, it's like an unsponsored opinion. Like their their stuff's like, except for that one pedal that Doug gave me, like everything else. Yeah, right. Know, 
it's, um, it's I, quite I, good. A friend of mine, um, Pat Farrell, bass player down here in Brisbane, he um, he just got his hands on one of the Tone Hammer preamps, and that has a, an overdrive circuit in it as well. Is that right? Yep. Mm-hmm. And he's 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 pretty pretty excited about that sound. Yeah, that's a really good. I mean, that's a really good pedal uh, preamp thing. Mm. Um, like they had an amp for a while called the AG500, and I think that saturation circuit was based on that. Right. But the thing that I didn't personally like about the AG500, and I've I've been with those guys since 2005, like that's the amp company I use. They didn't have a real, like the AG500 didn't have a really strong, um, didn't have a really strong uh, mid thing happening. And I feel like the pedal, the tone hammer pedal kind of fixed that. And so when they started to make the tone hammer amps, that's, yeah. that's why I kind of went that direction. Like I, I dug the AG500, but I like the tone hammer sound more because they, dealt more with the low mids and stuff like that yeah i used to have the ag500 s sc so just a single channel without the okay yeah i had the one with the distortion yeah and um, it was cool it was good i just that was my one gripe it's like i can't get this i can't get that like it's very clear it's not there's not enough grit to it Um, yeah yeah that's one of the things that i've kind of noticed about a lot of your like what you were saying like your sound is generally colored i would say would that would that be a fair call yeah i i would say um to a certain extent it definitely is um at the very least now like with with the stuff that i record i mean i'll put a little bit of compression in there um and so that helps with certain things but but like uh yeah, if there's any overdrive or anything, like that's that's a big part of it. I don't know. I mean, like some of the stuff is pretty pretty clean too. It's just a, I mean, I tend to um I used to be a little bit more into rolling the tone further off, but now I kind of put it in the center. And I found that like if I'm playing against something, that seems to be the right amount. Um I don't know, because like you use more like Fender style basses too, right? Like I know you got like an F bass and stuff like that, but like, yeah. you know, that kind of sensibility where you're not, you're not using more preamp than you need to, you know, it's like, you're almost, I, I try to approach it from making it, making it sound good before there's any real uh, use of preamp. I think yeah. for me, the pickups by themselves as passive pickups they have to sound really good to my ears that way. And then, then, you know, like it's easier to put in like overdrive distortion. Um, sometimes I'll get clever with some of like the stuff I've posted on um, Instagram, for example, like sometimes I'll double tracks because gotcha. it's, you're, I'm mixing for someone who's waiting in line looking at their phone. So like, that's the thing, like there's, <laughs> I wouldn't mix, like if I was making a record, which yeah. I'm sort of working on a new one now, but like if, if I was mixing for a record, it wouldn't be the same as like, Oh, this is going to be on Instagram. So it's, there's it's that. Such, a, such an interesting, you know, situation that we're in where those are some of the artistic choices that we need to be make, you know, like will this sound good on an iPhone speaker? Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I think it's taken people a long time to come around to that. But I also think it's like, well, here we are, you know, like they're so they're like, I think I started to take social media really seriously. Um, I mean, maybe not as seriously as some people, because some people really <laughs> jump in and kind of built their business around their social media. For me, like, I think I was doing a lot of live stuff. So it didn't really occur to me to um, spend a disproportionate amount, a disproportionate amount of time on social media. Like it was more like, okay, well I'm playing gigs and I'm meeting people and I'm out in the world. So that's helping my cause. But in the current state of the world that we're in um, and even before this, I mean, I, I was getting 
a decent number of calls for studio sessions. I got gigs from social media and like it sort of drives for lack of a better term, it drives my business, man. So it's like, um, I think just trying to figure out like how to keep your posts sounding a certain way or whatever, that's, it is a weird consideration. And it's also not, that's not really how anyone would mix a record, you know? Yeah. But if you're trying to get someone's attention and just what's it sound like, they're just going to have their phone on the table and they're watching it, then I think it's okay. Yeah. You know? I think one of the things that I've found is that I actually need to do roll off quite a lot of bottom end when I'm yeah. when I'm recording for for Instagram because the the iPhone speaker just craps out it's just just gets right. story so you can actually you don't really need anything below, below like a hundred hertz yeah to to come through and then you can then you can get it louder which is always important. <laughs> yeah i i don't know yeah it, it's a weird it's a weird thing man i would imagine there's there's probably like presets that people can they can like kind of see what it would sound like on the phone but i always test it yeah. just to hear what it's going to actually sound like because um even if not just for like the bass like there's stuff i program a lot of the drums that i end up playing along with so sometimes i want certain things that to, to be a little bit more audible um but yeah no it's it's all it's all a weird consideration you know and i definitely think a lot of the stuff that i like to hear from bass like if you know because like i play a lot of five string bass so uh, i mean i play a decent amount of four but if i'm playing five and i'm playing some low b stuff like you're not going to hear that if your phone is just you're gonna you have to put on headphones and then you can yeah. hear it but i think just because of the way it moves air and the size of those speakers, like you're not, you're not really going to hear it yeah. unless you have he headphones on. Just got to got to wind that tone control open so you can hear the clickety clack of that low yeah. sharp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know that social media was intended to be an audiophile experience, but I still think it matters because I've noticed, like, I used to just I would record stuff on my phone and. I don't know. I mean, the other thing, the other thing that it's gotten me to do though, is like, I realized, wow, I need to like shed some technique because I'm, I'm a little bit sloppy. Like the room can hide some stuff. So, yeah, right. you know, I mean, I, I always practice and work on some maintenance things, but there, I remember I heard myself, like I recorded something into my, uh, into logic and I was like, Hmm, that's like not as clean as our, it sounds in the room, you know? So interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think you know, like the the whole social media thing is like if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, you may as well do it right, right. You know, because you you if you're if you half ass it, you know, you run the risk of damaging your reputation to some extent. Yeah, you know, and the the bar is so so high. Like people, the the production value of of a lot of stuff out there is is so high. So and people are really used to super high quality production for for free like as disposable you know entertainment it's like yeah you know, the amount of effort they can go into a, a one minute post can be crazy right i think the audio is the one place people aren't as forgiving like i don't think anybody's expecting like like a jj abrams style <laughs> like film with lens flares and stuff but but i think audio is the one time people can really that's not that hard to do, man, especially for like a minute, you know, it's like, yeah. Um, I mean, I think I, I say that now as like sort of having gone through some, some examples where I've worked on things and learned how to be more economical with the way I do it. Um, yeah. How, how, like, how do you, how do you, I mean, that's one thing that maybe a lot of people, especially you know i've been doing a, a bunch of like iso jam videos and stuff and right. people was like how do you record for you know like so how, what's your setup or progress for um recording a, an instagram clip um okay so one thing that i got in the beginning of the pandemic was i bought one of those irig streams okay. and what that is is it's a device that IK Multimedia makes. And what it lets you do is you can route audio from 
so I can pull up logic and I can play along. There's like pretty much all the videos I do that sound pretty good. Like if I haven't, like, well, I'll talk about the second method after this, but essentially what this does is like, I'll plug my bass into logic. If I'm playing with anything like, like a track or something that's in there too. So literally all it's doing is I'm running the audio from my interface into the iRig stream. Then the iRig stream is plugged into my phone which is an iPhone. And then I just open the camera app and put it on video. And I would set up that camera to film. However I would want to film, you know? Um, so there's, just so the, the iRig pro it's like got two connections, one for your laptop and one for your phone. Um, yeah. Let me see if I can, let me see if I can grab it. One sec. Yep. Okay, um, so you have, it's this device. Um, you run the RCA cables. Uh, it's like the device runs into here via RCA cables. And then there's a cable that uh, we have in front of me. You plug this into the, um, into the iRig and then this is a lightning cable. Gotcha. So, oh. so you're you're taking like the one of the outputs of your interface, mm -hmm. your computer interface, the the actual audio output of yeah. that into the iRig. Gotcha. Yeah. And so, if I wanted to like, and I could use, it's basically you're employing the camera, but you're using the audio from the external source. Yeah. So if I wanted to, um, like, if I wanted to stream, like, if I wanted to play live, I could do it that way. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But the way I ended up doing it was like, I just use it to make better sounding videos and it saves me the step of having to sync audio and video. Absolutely. But that's the second way I was going to, that's the second way I, I work on it. So if I want to do something that's longer than a minute, or even if it's a minute and I want it to just be, you know, I want it to maybe be different or have like different shots. Mm -hmm. um, like, I use Final Cut and I'll use the audio. That's that's a little of right there, Final Cut Pro. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so then, then what happens is you know you just the the real the real trick that people have to remember with all that is like so let's say like I got my phone and let's say like a second camera, um, and then there's another thing you can do which. I don't feel very critical of this, but like, it's just for production value. Like you can always mine your stuff. If you need an extra angle, like yeah. no one's really going to be that mad. Like, but, but like, essentially the thing is, is like the, the audio is coming from like the DAW. So you record it. And if you're capture, capturing video as you record it, you just make sure that you can sync the audio. So you clap, I do that thing where you clap. And that way, when you can see all the audio files, from the camera, you can you can basically line them up with the transient. There's automatic ways to do it in Final Cut, but at least just to see like what it looks like. And then depending on like what, you know, if I leave my monitors on and I want to listen to what I'm doing, like if I don't want to do it through headphones, mm -hmm. sometimes I'll mix a little bit of that in to like the direct audio just so it has some stuff. But um, it's not inherently that complicated. It feels silly to put that kind of, production into like a minute long thing but i think sometimes it pays off man or sometimes it just it's cool to do like i did something where i just took um i took like a drum thing that matt halpern played and then i made a bass track to it and i did all that in final cut you know yeah um, well i think a lot of, you know um a lot of the time people are, are kind of like the set up to record or whatever as part of their practice like i was kind of set up to i can just plug in and be ready to record to logic and stuff like that so then the next step of videoing it it's not like you're saying it's not too big of a deal one thing right. that i've actually discovered is that do you know photo booth the, yes. the app, that takes the audio from your computer oh i didn't know that <laughs> Yeah, so the other day I was just like, so that's generally what I do is I'll, you know, if I, even if I'm playing along to like a YouTube video, um, it'll record whatever your system is set to. 
Oh, um, that's pretty cool. So if you're, it, if might, you're, uh, it might be because I'm, I've got an RME interface that has okay. like a, you can internally route your system audio. Okay. So like you can, I can have, you know, my, um, like my, my DAW output actually go to another input and, um, yeah, and Photo Booth seems to pick that up. Wow. Uh, um, alternatively, you could always just, you know, play a track from your phone into your interface. And, yeah, so that's always worth a shot as well, is see see if your interface will actually, see if Photo Booth or whatever your internal webcam thing is, um, that might capture your, your audio that's happening. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I haven't really tried, I haven't really tried that. Um, so what's a shot? It, it, you know, it might make life. And then I just, you know, then I just airdrop that video to my phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, airdrop is the best, man. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's made it so like there's such a streamlined process to all this stuff now that it seems probably a little bit daunting in the beginning, but with practice, I mean, I found you know it can keep your workflow pretty pretty. Uh, pretty easy i mean there's other stuff too like uh i had a gig i mean remember gigs i had a gig like <laughs> la- <laughs> i had a gig last year where i had to um you know i didn't want to have any paper because i i didn't really want anything blowing around and uh i don't i didn't want to necessarily have to read a ton of stuff either so i wrote like truncated notes on like like lead sheets style stuff and then I used my phone to scan it in because you can use your phone to scan it in like with, with Mac now it's really cool. And then I just sent it. There's a, um, I think the app's called gig book. I like sent it to that and I was able to just put it right in my iPad and boom, that was it. So, I mean, I don't know, man, there's a lot. It's, it's funny how easy some of that stuff is. Yeah. There's, like, there's definitely things out there to help make your life easier. You know, yeah. If if you need that that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um what's life like in LA just now? It's been well, a bit tumultuous of recent times. Yeah, it's interesting because um you know, the, the one thing that's really difficult is a lot of the stuff that people come out here for is sort of on ice. Mm. You know, like there's no there aren't any real gigs. And all the comedy clubs are shut down for the most part. Like there's, they're trying to operate like restaurants and stuff, but it's not really, I think by and large people are kind of either in two camps, they're super freaked out or it doesn't exist to them. (laughs) And, and I'm in the first, I'm freaked out, but I'm not like going to like, you're not, you're not, I I got my wits about me. Like I'm not, I'm not irrationally afraid of stuff that I understand to not be such a big deal. You know, like, um, luckily by me, a lot of people are wearing masks and it seems like by and large, that's the most bizarre part of it because Mm -hmm. the, the social protocols of just going and doing a task, like going to the grocery store or whatever, like that is still a weird thing to have to feel any kind of anxiety about what Mm -hmm. other people's behavior around you is. Cause these are things that no one really thinks about aside from, okay, that person didn't return their shopping cart. (laughs) Now I can't park in the space because someone was lazy. I mean, now it's a whole other dynamic where the stakes are high in terms of how something like this can get trans transmitted. So I don't like looking at the world and being angry at people for, for doing that kind of stuff or like, but I think that's, that's like a weird thing that has crept into day-to-day stuff. Um, I don't know. Like, I don't know a ton of people who have left yet. Like I've, I hear there's like an exodus of LA, like everyone's leaving New York and LA, but it's not. Are there, are there really any, know. are there any like, um, like here at the minute, we were on like phase four lockdown, so mandatory masks, and we have a five kilometer radius that you're allowed to travel in. 
Okay. And for for in stage when we were in stage three for a while, they actually had like police and army roadblocks around the edge of metropolitan Melbourne, checking wow. people coming in and out. Like you had to have a you need to get like a a work permit to if you're going to travel to work and stuff like that. And if you didn't have a valid reason, fine you and send you back. Wow. Um, so there's no, no we, there's no restrictions on movement. No, there really should be though. I think I think uh, without trying to get too too into the weeds with politics, if perhaps if we had a different type of leader, or we had any kind of leader, <laughs> um, which is you know that's yep. how I feel about it. Like um, I think we'd have a much different set of circumstances in terms of the numbers you're seeing in the news yeah. and stuff like that. I don't think, I don't think we're, we're at a place where any of the normal stuff, even if all that stuff was in place, would be able to come back. But I think, yeah, no, it's, it's a nightmare, man. Cause you've, you've got people who basically don't think it affects them. You know, like there's people who literally don't think, that any of this is real. Wow. Um, there's somebody in my, on Facebook who he's a musician. I'm not going to out him because, and I don't really know this guy personally, but he's adjacent to friends I'll, of mine. I'll, I'll put his Facebook link in in the in the description. <laughs> <laughs> but he he thinks it's all BS, man. He thinks them. He thinks it's like overblown and stuff. And um, I don't know. Like I I have two friends who I have one friend she's been fighting COVID for like a hundred plus days and she's not getting better. Like she's not in the hospital, but she's not her, like she's not able to function like her three, her, three you know, months. Like her. Yeah. Then I have another friend who had COVID and he's fine, you know? And, and I think the part about this, that's really difficult for people to understand, like Americans generally kind of do, they, feel that they can do whatever they want. There's not really this community minded thing. Yeah. You realize how selfish that there should be at times like this. Yeah. It's, it's disturbing, man. Like that's, that's the part of this that I think is the hardest is realizing that like, it's kind of up to us as individuals, you know, mm -hmm. and like people have varying degrees of, um, like freedoms with that. Like I'm lucky that, you know, I have some money saved. I can kind of hunker down for a while. Like I'm not in a bad way financially, but if I was, I have no idea like what. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure you can think back to maybe times in your career where you were living gig to gig. And yeah. if you, you know, if a gig got pulled or whatever, that was a big deal. Yeah. There's, there's going to be people in, in that situation right now. And yeah. Hmm. We ha we have some uh, rules in place, like people can't get evicted, and people can definitely. Uh, there's there's been like a, a hold on rent, so rent can't go up because um, okay. every year generally landlords yeah. can raise rent, they, and they generally do. My place is rent controlled, so it's not ever going to be a crazy amount, but they definitely thought about the people in that regard, but no, it's like people, I think, I Is think there any welfare in place. Like, you know, you can get a couple hundred bucks a week or something. They had that for a while and they haven't renewed it yet. And oh. our, our Senate basically took a, they basically adjourned until September without any kind of deal in place. So it's, it's pretty terrible, man. Like, That's a shame. Uh, I, you know, I, I think the one thing about, um, about America. And I think this is why I think people need to travel. It's like, there's things about America that are great. And I think like there's things about it that, that definitely, um, definitely are things that great nations are, are, are sort of like they, they advance upon, you know, like there's, there's like a lot of wonderful things. I'm not running for office. So like, but like the, 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 um, the thing that sucks though is like there's a lot of weird anti-intellectualism and xenophobia where people don't even really know what it's like to go to some some other country and like 
go to a pharmacy and say, Hey, I'm having this issue. Like I, I was on tour once and I was having some issues in, in my left arm. Um, and, and I went to a pharmacy to buy some ibuprofen and the pharmacist, she talked to me about it for 20 minutes. She was like, Hey, and she's like, you don't want to take this a lot because it's, it'll cause bleeding internally. And you want to, you know yeah. what I mean? Like she was very in here. It's just like, yeah, you just buy the shit and, and buy, leave, so. buy like a crate at, you know, Walmart. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's a really strange time period for, for everything. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like imagine how much it would suck without the internet. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. I, I wouldn't even know. I mean, so for me, like I live by myself. Right. Um, so I've really been in isolation for most of this time. Any, and any pets or anything? No. Um, I wish at this point, like I'll, I'll see friends on a socially distanced basis, you know, but, but it's still sort of limited. Like it's outside and you know, it's not yeah. like, you, there's not very much one can do in that situation. Like you can't, you can't go to like a movie. You can't go see a band play. Yeah. You know, you can't play. And especially like play. as musicians, so much of our socializing is, is involving our work, you know, on the gig at a rehearsal in the studio. Like that's yeah. a lot of the social time that we have as musicians. Yeah. And when that's all taken away, you're like, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's pretty crazy, man. Um, like we're in, we're into this, uh, we're into this period now. Like we're like, what, like six months in five months in. Yeah. Um, Hey, I'm going to just stop for a second. Um, can I put my AC on? It might be loud, but let me know if it's too loud. Go for it. We've been having like a heat wave. So it's been kind of hot. I've, I've got the heater on down here. It's actually, co it's cold today in Melbourne. Hold it. Right. It's cold. It's like nine degrees. Do you hear this? Is it, is it messing with the audio? Okay. No. Now zoom, zoom cool. has pretty good background noise cancellation stuff. It's okay. Impressive. It's actually, it actually a lot of time thinks that bass is background noise. Oh wow. Yeah. It's like story of my life. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Zoom's screwing us all in the mix, man. Yeah. <laughs> um, Maybe I'll talk a little bit about, because you, you were in New York for a while. Yeah. So um, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about time in New York and then why you decided to up stumps, as you say, and go west? <laughs> um, okay. Well, so I grew up on the East Coast and um, I pretty much lived lived there for most of my life. Um so I moved to New York in the fall of 2004. Um, and I, before that, I was living in Boston because I went to Berkeley. And then I was hanging out there for a little while. And I was starting to go back and forth because the distance from Boston to New York, it's like a four-hour bus ride or train ride. So it was an easy thing to do to want to go travel and like hang out there for a couple nights at a time or a night at a time like me and some of my friends sometimes would go take the bus to go to the 55 bar and watch Wayne Krantz you know so that's how I met I met I've known Tim for a really long time and yep for Keith and Wayne so that's kind of how that whole thing started like there's a real natural progression where you start up in Boston and then you go to New York or some people go to Nashville some people go to LA. Um, right. When I moved to so New York, kind of like the the graduation of Berkeley is getting to New York. Yeah, I think getting to New York. In my case, I also had some work I was doing at the school. Like I was teaching at the summer, some of the summer things. Like okay. we had this thing for bass players called Bass Lines, which was like a week. So I was like a three day long thing where you you know you're teaching prospective students. Um, that was still when Rich Appleman was the chair of the base department. So like early two thousands. And then, um, I did that up until a couple years into Steve Bailey's time there. Um, and then I moved out here. So it didn't, wasn't really a cost effective thing sure. to fly from LA to Boston, but for many years, just being close to Boston, living in New York, 
I would go up to Boston quite a bit, you know, and, and work up there, or like play gigs or other stuff. So when I moved to New York, I was working with Dave Fusinski at that point. Like I was in, he had this trio called Keith Express and I was playing, or called Keith, we made a record called Keith Express. And then I was starting to also do some stuff with Screaming Headless Torsos. So my first, when I moved to New York, I already had sort of a tour, re- like that was going to happen a few months after I got there. Like I was going to go to Europe with the Torsos, which I did. And then through, through Fusinski, I met Vernon Reed um, a few months before I moved to New York. And so Vernon's like one of my dear friends now. And like, kind of like the first year I moved to New York, like within the first year I did some stuff with torsos. And then I went to Brazil with Vernon and started touring with him. And I was kind of doing both of those situations for a long time. And then, you know, I was in New York for, for 13 years. And uh, I'd say like the first third of it, I was doing a lot of that kind of stuff with those guys. And then so guitar players like you. Yeah, I guess that, that seems to be the, that seems to be like the, the weird thread with a lot of that. Like I've played with, you know, those guys, people like Alex Skolnick, Josh Smith, cool. um, a very tiny blip on the screen, but there was like an ill fated tour. I did with Tony McAlpine last uh-huh. year, but that whole thing kind of fell through. Um, I don't know. I've done some stuff with Javier Reyes. Like I'm on one of his records. So it's like, yeah, it's all guitar, like guitar stuff and things like that. But uh, I don't know. I I love keyboards too. And I like other instruments, but, (laughs) but I think for me, a lot of the music I like fundamentally is like guitar, bass and drums. So, so, um, so yeah. So I don't know. I, I guess, I, I felt like I had three different time periods in New York. Like the first third was doing a lot of stuff with, with uh, Fusinski and Vernon. Then that sort of tapered off and I stopped working with Fuse. We're friends and stuff, but that situation eventually came to an end. Yep. And um, then, you know, like I kind of, there was this period of time, I guess, where it was sort of during another interesting period for America. Like there was the financial crisis that, caused some problems like with gigs and stuff like there was like some weird cancellations and it wasn't obviously not on the scale that we're in now with COVID but but it was a challenge man that was one of the hardest summers I ever had in that city because a lot of stuff dried up and finances weren't as good as they should have been or could have been so it was a real dark time financially but I still managed to have a good time during that time period. Like I think back now, I'm like, there's some stuff I really enjoyed about, about being there, even when things weren't the easiest. Um, but yeah, then I guess the last few years I was sort of just freelancing around, you know, um, I took a pause at one point and got a day gig, like a part-time day gig for a while. Cause I was feeling sort of burnt on music and I still contend, um, I was pretty happy doing that, you know, cause that was the first time I realized, you know, there's, there's something to being a musician, even if you're a lifer where you've got to protect what drew you into it. And if you start to hate it, you can do all kinds of irreparable, irreparable damage to your career, you know? Mm. And so one reason why I really liked having a day gig is, it never allowed me to become bitter about playing and it gave me the ability to say no to some stuff that I just wasn't feeling like doing. What, so, what was the, what was the day gig? I was working part-time at Apple. Right. So um, like, like it was an interesting gig because when I was working there, th- this is like 2009, 2011. I was there for like two years and um you know, it's weird, you know, like I've, I've been in magazines and people knew some people, like people that know the kind of music I make, you know, it's a, we're not talking about a lot of people, but yeah. you know, they're like, I remember someone came in that recognized me and it was weird, man. Like, but I, I just was like, look, you know, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to make a record. And I was like, I was working on my second record and um, I didn't feel any shame in that position. Um, actually, one of the coolest stories I have, like right towards the end of my time there, um, 
it was like the summer of I forgot I think it was 2011 or t- and maybe it was 20 uh, 2012 I can't remember uh, I wasn't there for longer than two and a half years but um Dennis Chambers came in and <laughs> he was he was in there like with with uh because he was still playing with Santana and I have a lot of friends in common with Dennis like and we're from the same state like he's from Maryland I'm from Maryland but um you know I've been playing with people like Gene Lake Mm -hmm. um even around that time I was working with Gene um I I, there's a drummer from DC named Sean Rickman and he knows Dennis and um like a lot of mutual friends like Dennis knew Fusinski and Vernon and stuff and I let him hear uh like half of the tunes off of coaxial flutter because it was like a really hot day and he was just trying to stay out of the heat and stuff (laughs) so we kind of became friends and he actually tried to get me a record deal from listening to that stuff like he he like was like let me try to talk to mike varney and and nothing ever happened just the fact that uh that that like um he liked it enough to want to do that and i just we we just connected on um social media and i I, i've like we've message back and forth but i got i owe him a phone call that's so um and then there was another time like john mclaughlin was shopping there and they were having problems with the credit card machines and i had to vouch for him i was like this guy's money is good you can you can take his money (laughs) and then he emailed me like i i emailed him because i told him like you know i had been playing with fuse and i'm friends with tony who's his uh nephew tony gray right Um, okay so like he listened to some stuff and wrote me back. So, I mean, it was kind of a weird thing. And he was like really sweet. He said, look, man, I hope the next time um, I go in there, you're not working and you're on the road. Hmm. And, um, you know, that's a weird thing. Cause like, I think the business is even at that point was a little bit different. Like New York, even, even around that time period, it's a really tough place to sustain a creative lifestyle. Hmm. And I think unless you're like, independently wealthy you really have to figure out how to make it work and like i always dug having that day gig so that was sort of like a specific time period for me there and then so like the third part of my time in new york was mostly playing and teaching and uh i was just doing that and then you know that mixed with like remote sessions and things of that nature and i guess I sort of knew that I didn't, I didn't really see a future in New York anymore because I'd moved around a lot. Um, and it, that gets really exhausting. And I think to live in New York, if you don't own any property, like you're kind of always behind the eight ball of like rents going up and stuff like that. It can get really, really daunting. So, um, not that that doesn't happen in other cities, but I just felt like I was moving around a lot in New York and I wanted, I wanted to change and moving. Uh, sucks. I hate moving. <laughs> what's that? I hate moving. Yeah. It's the worst. I haven't moved. I only moved once in LA and that was just because when I moved here, I had a place where I was hanging for a couple months and then I knew that that wasn't a permanent situation. And then I've been in my place for a few years, but, um, yeah, it's it just kind of ran its course, you know, but I didn't leave New York with any there weren't any negative feelings. It wasn't like, ah, oh, screw New York. I'm done. It was very much like I've definitely had moments where when I lived there I felt that way where like I wasn't I didn't love it all the time, but Yeah. Do you do you think, hindsight, do you think but, the city shaped you as a player? Absolutely. Oh man, like that, that's the one thing I, mean, I know that that sounds very hyperbolic and and I think I think like people like to say that because it sounds like a nice part of the narrative but just so so people who don't maybe know my playing or know me when I moved to New York I very much was like influenced by like Matt Garrison and like Gary Willis and I still love those guys you know people like O'Teal and I, I had a five string that I was playing where I had a high C on there. Yep. And, um, you know, like my first record had come out a few months before, like literally a month before I moved, like Mad Science. That's my first record. So how, how old were you when you put out Mad Science? I was 28. 28. Okay. Yeah, I was 28. 
Um, so at that point, you know, like I was really interested in elements of that kind of bass playing. I mean, I had a really good foundation and I, you know, I was always really interested in playing grooves and pocket, but I was also interested in harmony and playing melodies and stuff like that, you know? So at, at a certain point, that was where my ears were. Mm. Um, I think from playing with people who are very unique on their instrument, um, like v Vernon Reed and Fuse are very unique guitar players. I think it started to dawn on me that like, well, technically Matt Garrison's my neighbor. And if someone wants him to play, they'll call him. Like I can't do what he does better than what he does, mm -hmm. you know? And, and like, I, it made me really think about trying to figure out whatever my lane is, you know? Um, and it sort of broke me out of that whole thing of, I want to sound like my heroes, you know, like I definitely don't think people have to try that hard to like understand the types of musicians I really looked up to. But I think what I didn't really want to have was like a situation where I play two notes and people think I'm somebody else. Sure. And I think, you know, that's always a thing everybody struggles with, but I think no other place really made that apparent for me other than New York and really just from kind of hanging out and observing the creative scene, you know, and just realizing that like everybody's trying to do something unique and be true to themselves. Well, and the, so the, guy, the guys that are booking the gigs or booking you for the gigs, are the guys that are unique and identifiable. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. I mean, and that's like a real, I found that to be one part very inspiring and then in a weird way, very freeing because then it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about not being able to play like so-and-so. Now I can just figure out what I like to do. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll work from that angle. And that's helped me as an adult musician immensely. That's not to say that like, I won't hear somebody that I really like and, and, you know, like, I don't know if I get intimidated, but you know, it's like you kind of like, oh wow, that's that's scary. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, um, yeah, I mean, just listen to any, like any bass player from Brazil at the minute. It seems like. Yeah. <laughs> One time I was on I was on this festival a couple years ago where uh, it was like I think it was 2013, and um, that should have been like I mean that was a low key bass hang for the ages because. Um, Stanley Clark was there, Victor Wooten's band was there, and that was when he had like five, like four bass players in that band. So it was like Steve, Anthony Wellington, and that guy Dave Welsh. And then um, then Scott Henderson's trio was there with Travis Carlton. Travis is one of my favorite bass players. And then um, Will Calhoun had a trio with Charnet Moffat, and that guy's a phenomenally good bass player. Right. And then you had all the Brazilian cats. And so there was one night – where Pippa Kina was hanging out at this hotel that we were all staying at playing like this acoustic bass guitar. And he and I just passed it back and forth. We were trying to pass it back and forth in time. <laughs> we were playing the chicken and it was fun, man. And like the music that I was playing, I didn't really play a lot of notes. Like I got like one solo. It was like Vernon's thing. It, it's right. not really a thing where I solo a lot, but like we it was, were like, playing it was like a normal, normal bass gig. <laughs> yeah, normal bass gig, like with one or two spots to do something. But when we were sitting there just going back and forth, I like chopped it up and he's like, oh, okay. Like, cause like he, he heard that set we did and it was just all big, you know, big grooves and, yep. pocket. Yep. but it like, he, it was funny, man. But you know, it was, it was cool to sit next to him and like, just hear him like rip on an acoustic bass guitar. And then, um, there are some other people too that were there. Um, that were like, I uh, forget the guy's name, man. He he was like another one of the real preeminent Brazilian bass players. I'll I'll remember it later. Have you come uh, across Junior Braguinha? Uh I met him out here. Okay. But I don't. I, at that time, I didn't know him. Like, he's, been, he's he's been here a couple of times with uh, Virgil Donati. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Him. That guy's great, man. There's like no shortage of great players like that, you know. Um, but. 
I think the other challenge with that, and I'm not, this is not to belittle anything about anyone who plays bass technically or not. I think now we're in the age where everyone plays fast. Hmm. So that's really not that, it's not always the most interesting thing. You know, I think there's some people that do it where it's like, like when Hadrian does it, it's, it's very clear and there's nothing there that's not intended to be there. And that's a very powerful thing. But yeah. I, I'm saying like, generally that's a tool that everybody, like most bass players of a certain ilk have at their disposal. So it comes down to, you know, like your phrasing and whatever your fingerprints are. Yeah. And, um, you, you still have to have um, information right. wrapped up in there. Right. And so what I figured out somehow really without anyone telling me, but just from like observing the room I was in, I was like, wow, I need to really be brave and not worry if I don't sound like what my heroes sound like. I got to figure out what I sound like and, you know, try to think like that. Because I think otherwise, um, I don't know. It just felt like it was the right time to make that shift. So, so, so it's almost like, New York kind of like opened your eyes and your ears, yeah. gave some chops, and then when you were ready to kind of develop your own voice, so to speak, LA was a good bed for that. I think so. I mean, I think there's an element to LA that I still haven't figured out um, because I think, and I think now that we're in this weird state of like flux where who knows what kind of industry will exist in a couple of years from now. Like um, I won't openly speculate cause I don't know. I don't think anybody knows, but I think on one hand you have people out here that do a lot of work that revolves around making money, which is not bad. Like you've got people, there's like the pop industrial complex. That's what I call it. <laughs> um, no one else calls it that. I don't think, but you've, you've got people that are in that world and um, it's a huge thing, man. Like the entertainment element of that, it's 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 definitely like a powerful world, and, and some people really want to be a part of that. Um, I found that's not really something I care that much about. Mm-hmm. Like, I know that my path is really the path of I'm gonna play with like pop star X, Y, and Z, um, and and like kind of getting to a place where I could accept that was challenging. Cause I feel like, isn't that the dream? Like you get on someone's big tour and, but I think because I've been behind the curtain enough and I know I have friends that have been and left things like that. The real recurring theme in being a musician. And I wonder if you feel this way too. There's always this element of like, what's next. And then it's not just what's next, but how much power do I have, Mm. you know? And I feel like if, if I was like almost, you know, if I was like 30, 30 years into a career and I didn't have any more power in, in my line of work than when I started, I think for me, that would be a problem. You know, what, what, what do you perceive as being power? I think power is being able to say no and being able to call your own shots right. and, and getting paid to do what it is that you do. Um, so ha- having, you know, your na- having your name in lights. Yeah. Or maybe not in lights, but just, you know, you, you've, you, I think people that just have carved out a lane that allows them to work, you mm-hmm. know? I mean, the thing is, is like, I don't have a lot of rules personally about what I would or wouldn't play if it makes sense. Because, because, you know, honestly, I mean, who doesn't love, playing like it's the greatest but i think there's other stuff that comes with it like it's like okay um how you know if it's like a touring thing how long will i be gone for what's the bread like do i like the people yeah it's, it's there's the, the difference between liking people right the big triangle right <laughs> the hang but, the music and the money you need two exactly. of these. <laughs> but then you have like the like the the idiosyncrasies where it's like well I like these people enough to be out for four weeks, but maybe not 12 weeks. Yeah. You know, so it's, I don't know. It's, it's like a weird, um, it's a weird, weird thing. 
But I, I think by and large, it's like, I think having power in, in this day and age, maybe not like, let's say prior to Mar- March of this year, it's just diversification, maybe having like a few different things going at once. I think that's really what, because I think the thing that really was interesting about my time in New York was the business really changed a lot, you know, like even just in terms of like the way people consume music. Like, mm. um, when I moved there, you know, I think I had just gotten my first iPod, like within a couple years of, you know what I mean? Like I had just gotten like the, the click wheel fourth generation. Yeah. Maybe that was the third generation, but it was like, I think it was the fourth, like the click wheel iPod. Well, I, remember I had, um, I did, I did some cruise ship work. And uh-huh. it came off a cruise ship contract and everybody was talking about iPods. And I was like, because, you know, back in, in those days in the cruise ship, you were pretty much isolated <laughs> right. you know, from, from everything else that was going on. And so I came back home and everyone was talking about iPods. I'm like, that's a, that's a stupid name for a thing. What? <laughs> Next minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was such a big thing, man. Like, that was a huge thing for me as, like, someone that put music out, too. Like, I, I benefited pretty greatly from the iTunes music store. So, like, the whole download thing. That was definitely, um, that was like one thing that was an interesting component. There were still record stores when I moved to New York. Like there was still Tower Records. Mm -hmm. There was still Virgin Megastore. Um, People still went to the record store, even though we were in this weird age where physical media is starting to struggle a little bit. Yep. Um, But, you know, by the time I left, it's like everybody's streaming stuff. Vinyl's kind of on the way back, I guess. Yeah, um, but it just seemed like, from a technological standpoint, there were other things at play in that city, um, because all of a sudden, live music's not the only thing people can do. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all these other ways people can entertain themselves. Mm-hmm. So it felt like a lot of the stuff that maybe people were drawn to New York with like in the 90s like and i wasn't there in the 90s so i i my i'm sort of idealizing it based on what my friends who were there during that time period have told me about but it just seems like there was even like with with like people going to the bars to meet women or you know like whatever like now these apps like tinder where you can just like swipe and like that that changed a lot probably for like a lot of bars i would imagine like i know that sounds silly but but I know that, like, in terms of the habits of the kinds of nights people would spend at bars, if that's what they're out to do. Like, I, I talked to a bartender once at this place near where I lived in Harlem, and he was telling me, like, people, that that's changed the <laughs> kind of night that people have. Like, how long they'll stay in a bar, blah, blah, blah. Because, you know, they feel that in terms of the money they make from tips and what have you. So, you just got to, like... The hardest thing to do sometimes if you're kind of in one particular corner uh, or niche. And so the music thing is very much like its own kind of community. So no one's really thinking about the bigger picture of what a giant metropolis like New York, like what are people doing with their spare time? How are they, how are they entertaining themselves? Um, You know, the one person I always like talking to about this, and I'd always see him real late at night. It was Jojo Mayer because he would sometimes like he'd hang at people's gigs and stuff. And he'd always have like interesting stuff to say about like where New York's been going and stuff. And interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's the thing. It's like from 2004 to 2016 when I left, it just seems like the way in which we consume media and music that's changed. So by and large, the effects of that, that affects everything. Like it's not, you know, like yeah, the, 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 the trickle down effect was real. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you notice that where you are? Like, like were, were people coming to gigs? Like, or was it, was there a drop off or, you know? Um, well, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm originally from Glasgow in Scotland. So yes. I've been here for six, six years, coming up six years. So okay. from like 2014, um, so it's hard for me to really say because the first couple of years you're still trying to get into the scene, find some gigs and stuff like that. But from what I know, 
like what you were saying, you know, from what I know, speaking to guys who have been here their whole lives, yeah, it's definitely less gigs, more musicians, less money. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's sort of a new paradigm for a lot of people, you know, and I, I think yeah, it's an uncomfortable one. I think we're in a situation now with COVID where everybody's been sort of face facing. Not, I wasn't going to say facing the music because that would be too too stupid and obvious, but like, right. <laughs> but people are facing like an alternate existence without performance based mm-hmm. income or performance, at least for now. Yeah. And so I would imagine for some people who really that's their arena, it's probably really hard for them. A lot um, of the older cats. Especially. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not you know, no fault of their own. It's just like, I mean, why wouldn't you, if, if, if you're able to make a great living from playing great music that you love, right. of course, why would you ever really think about diversifying? Because this right. is an unimaginable situation, really. Yeah. No, nobody could prepare for this moment. But uh, I think I like doing production stuff and I like making tracks. And so there's an element to my existence where I've, I don't mind. Sure being a hermit and working on stuff. And then at the end of the day, I've got like some stuff that I worked on and then, yeah, I don't know, but, but I will say even, even as like just a balancing act, I'm, I miss playing mm. is to me playing a gig is really where you can get, if not from anybody else, just from the feeling of like, you can validate, okay, is what I'm working on. Is this effective? Like, is it working? Am I, you know, is Are what I'm connect? trying to, Hmm. yeah exactly is it gonna is it resonating with people and and you know that's a real it's a real ma- it's a real magical thing that i think has a healthy balance to the stuff where you're not around people um yeah. so and i think yeah, also, no, like a, a lot of musicians aren't cre- aren't artists in, in the in the idea that they're not creating their own art like yeah. a lot of especially sidemen, right? A lot of bass players, drummers, guitar players, keyboards are just, we're, we're guns for hire, you know? So right. then when, when, those, when that's not happening, when nobody needs to hire people, um, yeah. go, well, you need to start creating your own content, then, um, you know, people have had to quickly retool or go like, what do I, do I have anything to say? You know, which right. is maybe a good thing. You know, maybe there's going to be some more art from people who who didn't who weren't doing it before. But who knows? Yeah, I I think it's it's definitely. I feel really. I I, I can sympathize for people who are in that situation where it's like they're not. You know, like this was a an unfair hand that that we you know and like we're kind of at the lowest not the lowest part of the food chain but just because of the nature of how things are like Hmm. in the way people uh watch music live i mean there's i can't think like i've i've definitely stayed up at times like or i haven't been able to sleep since this started where i think about has there ever been a gig i've done that wouldn't be like super dangerous right now (laughs) just in terms of how many people that were there or the size of the room, because a lot of the stuff that I like playing exists in smaller to mid-sized rooms, and you you can't really avoid people in the in those spaces. The last gig I did before lockdown, I was playing with Mark Letary and um, this drummer Sean Wright, and there's already talk of Corona. Like everyone knew it was a thing, and people, this is kind of where people couldn't find hand sanitizer at the stores. Mm-hmm. There was like phases of it. It was like, first you couldn't find hand sanitizers. Then people were freaking out about toilet paper. Um, I know, I know. Um, but it was fun, man. Like playing with Mark's a blast. I've, I've done it before. And I played two gigs with him. We had a great time. But I remember like after both gigs, in between every time I'd talk to somebody, I'd go wash my hands and like mm. hand sanitize and like, you know, that pre some shit's about to hit the fan paranoia was about to set in. Where where was the gig? 
Um, we played one that was sort of down in Orange County. I forget the name of the venue. Right. But then we played one in downtown LA. And like, dude, there is no stage. We were like surrounded by people. Um, is that the I think Blue I posted. Whale? Huh? Was that the, is that the Blue Whale? Not the Blue Whale, but um, a similar type of setup ultimately, where like we were just in this middle, the middle of this room. Everyone was surrounding us. We had to like, you know, there was no way to get around people without passing through them. Yeah. So like imagining that scenario now is like, you know, like it's just, it's do terrifying. You know, do you know the, the sex player, Bob Reynolds? Yes. Not super well, but we've met and we have mutual friends. He, he posted a, a, a vlog maybe a month, a couple of months ago, because he was on tour in Italy and Europe. Like he basically, it was like a tidal wave <laughs> following him around and he he got sick you know the the vlog's amazing like he was so close he he got sick really sick so he's flying back and he had the mask on stuff he didn't have um covid but he had something pretty similar like flu like symptoms and stuff wow yeah and just that that story of like every every city they left it would kind of like get shut down (laughs) and going on stuff and going oh maybe this is a serious thing you know yeah. <laughs> yeah, there are a few people I know that were over there. Like Tim, Tim was over there with Krantz. That's uh, right. Yeah, I think Yannick was with Bob, right? Were they kind of out? Yeah. Um, yeah, it just it was weird. I, to be honest, um, when I when I went to Nam, because you know that's Nam's like forty five minutes from here. Like Anaheim's about forty five minutes from LA. Uh, something like that. I don't know. Like. If traffic's good, about mm-hmm. 45 minutes. This is in um, January? No, it's January. January. Yeah. Um, people were talking about COVID, man. Like, it was definitely not something that, because there was, you know, there was like some, I mean, this definitely sounded like some campfire ghost story type stuff at the time. But someone was saying, like, be careful in, like, the Hall E because someone got carried out on a stretcher. And and it was like, what? You know. And now, now it's like, you can totally understand and believe that. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 weird, man. I I really think that uh, that you know, I'm not a vir- virologist and I'm not a scientist, but based on like the time frame of everything, and considering that Nam, you have like ten thousand people in that space mm-hmm. um, at any given point, I would imagine like it would seem irrational to think that COVID nineteen wasn't around at mm-hmm. some point. Especially because it's people from all over the world, right? And and like LAX is a global that's a global hub. Yeah, you know. So so it, yeah, it's it's a lot of weird. You know, it, it's it's been a really bizarre. It's, it's yeah. been bizarre, man. Just the yeah. whole thing. Um. So thinking about your solo career, you know, you you released uh, My Science when you're 28, and then Coaxial Flutter, which is a killer album. Thank you. I love that. Um, how, what's been your arc or your path or your goals in terms of being an, an, an individual artist and what if, what would you, if you could go back and give yourself some advice, um, you know, back in the day, what, what would you, what would you, what would you say having learned what you've got now? Well, you know, it's weird when I did mad science, I don't know that I had a real grand design with it like there wasn't any kind of but i would definitely say um no exaggeration i would not have any kind of career if it wasn't for that because through mad science um you know i'd written a couple tunes that i wanted guitar on and i really felt like dave fuzinski was the right guy for it because um anyone could have played guitar on those tracks and it would have been it would have been cool like I could hear Mike Stern playing on that stuff and it would probably sound awesome. Or I could hear someone like a, uh, even like a more blues kind of guitar player with less jazz vocabulary Mm -hmm. playing on that stuff. And it might be cool. But the thing I liked about Fuse's playing is like, he's got sort of like this weird, unique take on things. And, and besides his vocabulary, which is cool, he's got like a real sonic palette. So, Mm -hmm. um, I just kind of went for broke and asked him if he wanted to play on it, you know, and 
it's one of those things where he was willing to do it. He wanted to hear what it sounded like, you know, and I had some stuff where I played it with some friends. Uh, and so he, he was down and it was really just, I was just trying to get him to play on my stuff. He liked my playing. And we, when he started teaching there, we started to jam and somehow he started calling me for music. And that really helped me position myself with other people. And, uh, it was a good way to go around New York as like a new person there and talk to people like um, some of those musicians in that circle. Um, so it gave you a bit of kudos clout. Yeah. Or, you know, it's just at least a way to like make it less awkward to <laughs> talk to somebody. I mean, I think the thing is like, no matter what, people are very forgiving. Like if you just want to say hi and then you talk from there and like, you don't have to have an angle. Like, you know, like, Hey, I play with this person. Like I found most people I meet, even if I don't know if they're a musician or not and find out later, although that person's amazing, you know, like I've, I've had that experience too, where it's like, you know, like there's a, there's a kid. He's not, I don't think he's not a kid, but he's like younger than me. Um, I gave him, you know, I teach him every now and then. And uh, he's in this dope metal band called Moon Tooth. And they're awesome. Like, <laughs> complicated music. The singer's great. The cool. guitar player and the drummer are great. He sounds great playing the bass lines on that stuff. And it's like, this kid's super humble. And so mm -hmm. it was like one of those things where it's like, you just don't know who you're talking to. I don't think people have to necessarily sell what their relationship to the music industry is when you just meet somebody on like a gig or something sure. or at, at their gig. But yeah. for whatever reason, it gave me some confidence to talk to people and like trying to hustle. But, you know, I don't know. It, it's weird. It, it gave me like a good um, sort of a good thing to have in the back pocket. But what it also did was it started to get me to think about composition and think about like, what what can be done with instrumental music now mad science is definitely you can tell i'm sort of trying to make sense of my influences yeah and i would argue that like even though its intent wasn't really to be a bass record it probably comes off like a bass record but maybe a well-intended bass record where, where some consideration was was made for songs and and like um by the time I got around to doing Quaxia Flutter, I was way more confident with who I was as a player. So there's um, moments on there where I play stuff, but I was more concerned with like the writing sure. than playing. Um, but I think to answer the second part of the question, if I could go back and give myself advice, I think I would have done more to play more shows as a solo artist. And I would have tried to make more records and document stuff more frequently. Um, because I think I probably had more there that I could have built that I just didn't consider because I think I still really wanted to be a side man and play with different people. And you didn't, you didn't, want, that to, seemed, you didn't want to be known as the guy that does like the crazy instrumental music because you might not get the call for the straight ahead R&B gig. Yeah. But I think in retrospect, now I don't think I would mind that so much because I think we're in this world now where a lot of those scenarios don't really come up. Mm. Like not to the extent that like things are like life altering, you know, like, if, like I, I don't, I think I got to like one day I realized, you know, cause, cause I have friends that are amazing musicians. Like one of the guys who plays drums on both my records, Adam Deitch, like Adam's oh. ridiculous. Like he plays Lando's great. One of my favorite bands in the yeah. universe. I've known those guys since we were kids. Like I, I met them the same time they met each other. And there was actually, not that this matters, but here's a little like side story that only a few people know about. Um, when we were in college together, there was like another thing where it was like myself, Adam Deitch and Jeff Basker. And so those tunes on Mad Science, like Orange and a couple of the other ones were, it's the three of us, like Actual Proof. We do a cover of Actual Proof. And um, we do another tune. Like we used to, that's when Deitch would play more of his fusion stuff. Right. And Jeff, it's like, Jeff's now like a Grammy award winning 
producer, but at the time he was a jazz comp major hmm. and we were working out like, you know, we're trying to play like stuff like Herbie tunes and yeah. weather report. And so while this was all going on, like lettuce was doing their thing. But my point with Adam is like, he's a really, really great, there's so many things he can do on the drums that are not just what people know him for. And I think like he's definitely made records. Like he has like a quartet record that's got some jazz type yeah. stuff on there. That's but, like, like um got like pyramids on the cover or something, I think. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And he's got yeah. he does the, the break science stuff. Yep. But he's got, you know, he's got like really he's got chops, man. And like I I don't know that he's ever felt the need to like flex in that way or like make music that that reflects the amount of facility he actually has. But mm -hmm. if he wanted to, he could. Mm. Um, but I think what I like about the way he does it is he's always been very aware of like what he likes to do and what he doesn't mind that people perceive him as having a strong suit being that kind of a drummer. Sure. Uh, you know, and, and like, but, but I think like, you know, for me as a, as a side musician, like sometimes it can be confusing because of people, I think about this a lot because if I put up a weird clip of me doing something that's weird, like I know nobody's going to call me to do that. Yeah. But I know that like, I could also make a clip of just doing a walking baseline and, and it would be like the kind of walking baseline everyone would want to hear on their shit. So it's like, but I think ultimately, um, I think having a lane is more important now than just being part of the status quo. Cause I think, especially in this moment that we're in now, like mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if you know, 500 songs you can play on a wedding. Year. That at this point, I mean, it doesn't mean that there's no value in learning that, but I'm saying if someone threw you a raft and like, here's how you survive COVID-19. Let's say like you have like two things, like you have the knowledge of 500 songs, but there's no gigs <laughs> or let's say you have a unique paradigm and a unique perspective and you're doing something interesting. Yeah. That's currency now. So, and, and especially now because we have, we have a direct connection to the people who will be into that shit. You know? Right. Right. Well, you, this is this is the phone is your global shop window. You know, Instagram right. stories like the, the way to connect with people and like what you were saying Absolutely. about documenting what you were doing with the with your first couple of albums. Like people right. want to be on that journey with you and they want to to yeah. see and and know and connect more because they're used to that and so many other things that, that they're into. Yeah, I mean, I think for me too, I really like the elements of bass playing where you're just playing with people and trying to make whatever the music is work. Yep. So, so like from a personal goal standpoint, like I care what drummers think, mm -hmm. like when we're playing together, like I want it to feel how it's supposed to feel. I want it to sound good. And like, I've played with enough drummers that are so different from each other, man, where it's like, like the first drummer I played with when I moved to LA was James Gadsden. Mm. So playing with that dude was like amazing. And like, we were just playing kind of old R and B stuff that sounded like records he had played on, which is probably weird for him, but like, <laughs> but like he and I had a nice lock and he was, he, we were talking about playing and he had some cool stories about Jamerson and like just how he had total recall and stuff like that. But he was saying, he's like, I could tell you play other music, but you're, you have vocabulary in this. So it feels the way it's supposed to feel, you know? And then I've played with like people like, like Keith Carlock and uh, Thomas Pridgen. And then like I've done stuff with Cindy Blackman and it's like, they're all really different, but as a bass player, like, even though I, I'm saying like, I think having an identity and like a creative, a creative uh, path is important. I think I do take a lot of pride and pleasure in like being able to play with people and like trying to make the music work. So I, I say that, but I'm not saying that, at the expense of being like a good bass player. But I just think ultimately the path of being like a session person is a little bit harder to define now. And in a weird way, I find that having a thing that people know you for helps you get work. So it's like a weird, 
Right. I don't know if I'd call it a catch twenty two, but it's similar to that. It, maybe because um, extremes are now less extreme, you know. Perhaps. Right. You know, so what might have been viewed as that's some pretty far out fusion stuff is like, well, that's actually pretty tame compared to, you know, what what we have right. now or, or whatever. Sure. Yeah, um, all... This, uh, I don't know if you can see that. This groove. Right. Yeah, yeah. This, um, this funk, True Fire TV, all different kinds of funk. So is funk you know, a real pillar of your bass playing and your development? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I would say that like, well, okay. So I grew up in the nineties, you know, like I grew up in the eighties, but I came of age in the nineties. Sure. How, so how old are you just now? I'm, I'm 44. Okay. So like I'm generation X. Um, at that time period, like when I was in high school, um, you know, you had bands like Living Color, yeah. um, Fishbone, Primus, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, and and those were gateway bands for other stuff. Like for me, like with uh, like you know, like through the Chili Peppers. Like I remember reading that like one of the songs he did was like a uh, meter song. It's like, well, who are the meters? You know, and then uh, like checking out Parliament Funkadelic and stuff like that, like that rhythmic thing, that's probably the, the style that most had an effect on my concept of groove. Right. And then, you know, I also liked a lot of progressive rock stuff like Rush was a huge deal for me mm. as a young musician. And even as an adult, like really like the more that I learned, cause I didn't really know anything about their story. So I didn't know that they just were like, we're going to do whatever we want or else, mm. you know, like it was kind of, you know, I, I think I think they're they're like one of those bands that like a lot of young musicians flock to because they're just playing but the songs are cool. So it's like they, no they, one's they, really yeah. gonna like it's not like here, let me put on this instrumental shit that's like really hard to understand, but mm -hmm. there's cool fills or cool solos. It's like, well no, this is a song you can hear on the radio and here it is. Um a lot of the, the music I like though seem to have roots in R and B and funk. Even is if that, it was filtered through like that's, uh, that's a, a, a Maryland thing as well. Oh, I don't know, man. Um, that's a good question. Scott Andrew like, says hi, by the way. <laughs> oh, cool. Tom. Um, yeah, Scott's cool, man. Like the one thing about being adjacent to DC, because I I grew up not far from DC. Mm. Like, there's a style of music there called go go, mm. which Chuck like Martin. has been, huh? Chuck Brown. Chuck Brown, exactly. Um, you know, like Miles Davis had had Ricky Wellman on drums during like the Amandala period, like for live stuff. Um, he was really into that pulse and that type of music. Like you hear Chuck Brown or like the Junkyard Band. The closer you got to DC, like people would drive around with that stuff pouring out of the car. Like, mm. and that groove is infectious, man. And mm. it's just like that kind of like that slow that that's like where the quarter note is um like that whole thing really even though like i didn't go to many go-go shows and and if i'm being fair to the times a white kid from the suburbs probably wouldn't have wouldn't have been the safest thing to do right. depending on like where that show was like there was mm -hmm. a club called the ibex which was like a big place for go-go and it wasn't safe like there was always like potential like violent things that could pop off but nonetheless like that music was accessible so i think that was like a pocket from from dc that even if like i can't say that i listened to a ton of it but i heard it a lot and i think it did make me think about like pocket and stuff like that but the, um, the minneapolis the prince thing seep in as well a little bit Oh yeah. Like Prince was like, when I was a little kid, like third grade, like I got purple rain and that album changed my life. Mm. And hmm. not even in like the exaggerated sense. Like I, I heard it. It really made me want to study music. There's strings at the end of the song purple rain that, yeah. you know, that whole part of it just 
still blows my mind. But um, yeah, like just I remember listening to even stuff after Purple Rain because I didn't really. I've always been like a huge Prince fan, but I didn't really become like a mega Prince fan until I could start to like deep dive into bootlegs and like mm. have access to more stuff. Yeah. Um, Cause I don't think even as a kid, I was aware that he played all the instruments, you know, like it was more like I thought he had a band, the band was doing all that stuff and they, and to a certain extent they were, but you know, like um, it wasn't until I was at Berkeley for this five week program when I was in high school that one of the RAs, she was a huge Prince fan and she was like, you should listen to this because he's playing the bass and he's playing everything else. And it was like for let's work or mm. something. I was like, that's one of the greatest bass lines I've ever heard. Um, so I don't know, man, it's weird. Like the funk thing was always, the funk and R and B thing was always kind of in the background. Um, but I'm one of those kids too, that like when I was in seventh grade, like around the time I started playing, I really like metal and I really like hip hop. And for me, like Injustice for All was like one of the biggest records of my youth. I still love that record to death. And when I was like, you know, so it's like, so if you there's if a lot of things. metal and hip hop anthrax. Yeah. Anthrax. Absolutely. Bring the um, noise. <laughs> yeah. Um, also like, I think, I think that's, I don't know. I always really liked the drums. I always really liked the drums and I always really liked, I couldn't decide between drums or guitar before I started playing bass. So I think <laughs> a lot of my influences were bass players that were sort of in the middle of all that. Right. Um, so, so yeah, but like funk is definitely, that's the pulse that informs most of how I would approach playing stuff, even if it's not funk. Mm. Um, you're very you know very gritted out or like a lay back if i need to or you know yeah i guess that's that's it but there's, i found can, that go ahead i was going to say you know there's certain bands that spring to mind like extreme um, right or like pantera you know they're not they're not funk bands but man they've got oh. a groove oh man yeah pantera van halen van halen like if you listen to those first six records shuffles i mean they were cool with sammy but like the stuff there's like a swagger to those grooves yeah. that comes from like that whole thing. Yeah, absolutely, man. Like Guns and Roses, Pantera. I would say, you know, like Duff. And, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, Duff was great. Um, Helmet, there was a kind of a metal band called Helmet. They had some cool rhythms. That led to my fascination and love of Meshuggah. Like I heard Meshuggah in the 90s. Right. One, of my, one of my friends, was a, is he's like a big metal fan. And he's out here. Um, he, I remember walking by his room, his dorm, and I heard it was one of the songs. I think it was um, Future Breed Machine. And like the guitar solo, like Frederick sounded, he sounded like uh, Holdsworth. So I walked by as that part was happening. I'm like, what is, <laughs> what is this shit? Like, who is the new Holdsworth album? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, he's like, it's Meshuggah. And so, you know, they were kind of thrashy at that point. But then the record that came out after that, um, Chaos Fear. Mm. That was where, like, where the rhythmic thing kind of, like, they've gotten, like, exponentially more into that realm, but Chaos Fear kind of blew my mind. Yeah. So, I don't know. I think that's really at the helm of what I like to do with music and with bass. Like, rhythm has always been at the front and center of it. Even though I like playing melodies and mm -hmm. I would much rather, like, the rhythm is what pulls me in. 80% of the time. Did you ever, did you ever get into Dillinger escape plan? Yeah. Yeah. Those guys are crazy, man. Those guys blew my mind as well. I remember seeing them live and, um, it was just like a force of nature. Holy. Yeah. Shit. I'm friends with Liam, man. Every now and then we'll like text and stuff. He's, he's really great. Yeah. Cool. That's, yeah. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about, um, teaching education yeah. how you how you approach it what you what you see maybe as common um common issues that you need to deal with a lot with students um what you think are some maybe core pillars that people should really always be focusing on 
Right. Well, um, I think the biggest thing I notice with students um, is there's a need and a desire to want to learn how to connect everything. Mm. So um, a lot of times it comes down to how does one build a vocabulary? How does one use that vocabulary? And, and the thing about being a bass player um, is generally sometimes like you don't have to use very much of it to be effective. You know, like you could take an idea and offset it by like one sixteenth note and all of a sudden it's a completely different idea that makes the whole thing work different. Totally. Yeah. Or, you know, there's like all these little tiny things that you can do with bass. It's not as grandiose as like being like a keyboard player or a guitar player where it involves, you know, like sometimes bass, there's like tiny little changes you can do or little clever things that, that can really, um, make something work but it's always different you know it's always like i think like for me like the a lot of the students that i end up teaching they it's not even about chops or soloing you know like i'll occasionally get a student that wants to learn Mm -hmm. weirdo techniques that i use and i'm always very very adamant about saying look this stuff is fun but it's not going to get you gigs and if that's why you want to work on it. Like, don't feel like you have to, if you're just curious and it's something you want to work on, it takes a lot of time to be able to use it. Otherwise it's just something to do, you know, for fun. Sure. But, um, the stuff that I end up working with people on is like how to organize an approach to using, um, their harmony, their sense of harmony and like maybe their sense of like melody if they want to like, get into playing fills but like how do you even organize that like how do you how does one decide where to put something Mm. and and a lot of what i end up teaching people how to do is like think in terms of like eight bar phrases or think in terms of 16 16 bars Mm -hmm. or think about like subtle things you that you can play that don't involve changing your part too much Mm. you know and then um so a lot of times it it ends up getting people to identify what they know already and how to like expand on that. Mm -hmm. So if someone's like, Hey, I only know how to use like a G major pentatonic scale. And then it's like, cool, try that over E minor. And then tell, you know what I mean? Like just try to find like a little mind blown. (laughs) Right. Just, just trying to find like tiny things that people can do. That's like one little step outside of what they're very comfortable doing. And I think like that's, the pace at which really being able to have an approach where you're using vocabulary. I think the way I learned, that's how I learned. Like I would take one or two ideas and figure out what to do with them in a couple different contexts. And then that gave me the confidence to like, okay, I understand what this is. I can use that or I can, you know, it's at my disposal. Mm. Um, so I, I think a lot of what my approach to education is, it's mostly trying to give people usable things that they can take with them and use in various situations. Um, but there's, like there's, there's, something, there's, there's obviously going to be some universal tools, right? Right. Time, right. bone, technique. Yeah. Um, you know, tertiary harmony, all that kind of stuff. That stuff. But even more basic than that, like note lengths. Yeah. That really is a thing that, that, um, listen I try to, Bernard, to get... listen to Bernard Edwards and, <laughs> you know, right. try and play, try and play those sheet grooves with all long notes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or just knowing like what it's, what to do in a situation where you might have to play lots of notes, but some of them are rounder than the others, you mm-hmm. know, and like some people rob the very last 16th of beat four, you know, like there's all, there's like that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm sure like for some people, like they'll come to me and like, I'll be like, yeah, you should focus on this. And they're underwhelmed by how simple it is to point that out. But it's like, no, this will really change how you play if Mm. you you focus on this. Um, so that's what I try to do with people. And I try to get them to think about, um, just things that like, 
I can relate to them that are useful. Like one thing that I like to get people to consider is like practicing stuff at different tempos, but not like, not like slow, medium, ludicrous speed. Like, okay, this feels good at 108. How's it feel at 110? Or how's it feel at 106? Because that's a challenge that, I mean, I don't know if you've had that experience, but I definitely have had that experience where like, if something moves by like two BPM, it could feel strange, mm. you know, and like can totally not feel comfortable. And it's a weird mind. Oh, I think, like- I think a lot of time, like for me, I discover a lot of my um, rhythmical accuracy is a lot, a lot of time connected to my, my muscle memory, my technique. So yeah. stuff that, stuff that feels good at one twenty when you put it down to 190 or when you put it down to 90, it's like that always sounds rushed. Right. Whatever. It's like, on the- theoretically, it should be just the same. It should be just as easy, but because a lot of your, you know, those muted notes or those go- you know, ghost notes or the way you articulate things is wrapped up in your technique, it also affects your, your timing. Yeah. That this is, this is, it's a good observation that, you know, running stuff at, subtle different speeds and paying attention to how it how how you how you sound in relation to it right like i rake you know and like yeah. you are a little bit too fast the whole thing comes apart you know mm-hmm. like i don't rake for everything but for certain things i'll i'll do that and i've it's one of those things where it's like really got to be aware of like how fast every little movement is if you're doing economy of movement mm-hmm. uh economy of motion type things. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I definitely, um, I'm a devil in the details type of player. Like, you know, like I, I really try to figure stuff out and yeah. I really try to figure out like how to be economical with stuff or I try to figure out like how much exertion I have to have to make something jump out a certain way. Mm. Um, I, I'll say for me, like my own personal interests in recording have made me a much better bass player. Because I can see, you know, I can listen back to something and hear how clear it is or, like, where I might need to emphasize stuff. Or if I don't like how it's sitting, I can, like, figure out where I need to lean back. Mm. I don't know. So I think, like, when I'm teaching, especially if it's people who are trying to work on, like, I get people that, they, you know, it, it comes in this form. I want to work on my groove or I want to work on my time feel. And so it's, like, oftentimes trying to diagnose where the improvement might need to occur. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to say, I don't like to say problem because nothing's really a problem. You know, if you lock your keys out of your car, that's a problem. But like, if you, you know, if you're, if you're just not able to like make something feel a certain way, like that's, that's not a problem. It's just a challenge that hasn't been overcome yet. So I try to think about like what the student is playing. And I, you know, a lot of times it's like one tiny thing can make the difference. It's like, okay, you're not letting this note ring long enough. This is the note you need to lean into, not the downbeat. Mm. Even though the downbeat feels like it's the most important thing, it's really, it's really beat two. That's where the weight of that groove is. So it's like, you know, kind of getting people to think about stuff. But it, it's weird because I think I'm a more neurotic musician than some. Mm. Like, I'll listen to shit and just be really crit like you know like i wouldn't say that like i've never worked with donald fagan so i couldn't tell you if it was like being steely dan but i'll listen back to stuff and really pay attention to like do i sound like i'm rushing there or does that sound like a like a breath you know you know and like i have to like call myself out when i'm being too obsessive but you know how in logic you can just run takes yeah you can have like a stack what i tend to do rather than retake stuff and obsess, I'll let myself do two passes and I can sort of see if it's like a, just a momentary thing or if it's like a, Oh, do I need to like work on this? So it feels better. You know, sure. Um, I get sure. called sometimes to play crazy shit, man. <laughs> That's the problem. Like when you put out technical stuff, all of a sudden people <laughs> want you to play technical stuff. And then it's like, <laughs> and so you, so you just get the logic marker set up like two bars at a time. <laughs> Those two yeah. bars. <laughs> I've done one record like that. Um, and like, 
I didn't feel bad because I'm pretty sure that's how everyone else recorded that record. But yeah. um, ideally, you don't want it to be like that unless there's a good reason to, like you're changing sounds. Yeah. And you want to make sure that it's a clean thing or maybe you have a different... Because I like I've done recordings right where, where I'll use um, different effects, but they're not used in tandem. So it's like, okay, I want it. Okay. It's just going to have to be done like this. Yeah. There's, there's no other logistical way but it makes the most sense because it's going to sound the best in the end. So yeah. U using, using the studio tools to the fullest. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple other tricks I'll use too, which I think sound cool. It depends on what it is, you know, like I'll use flex time. There was a baseline. I just played on someone's record where they wanted it to be like a robotic 16th note thing. Like they didn't want it to really percolate like a Jocko baseline or like mm -hmm. a, power power they wanted to be like kind of like an arpeggiator right so i could play it and i could come really close to that sound without anything but i was like let's put flex time on it and quantize it and see what it sounds like because it's all 16th and it sounded cool yeah so i kept it in there man and i didn't feel bad like you know no i could nail it live but that's an effect that i couldn't no one can achieve on their own but it sounded you know it still sounded like bass guitar it still had like the the transients that bass guitar can only create because, you know, you're dealing with strings and vibrations and yep. the attack between the different sizes of string. See how obsessive I am? Like that's, <laughs> that's you can really get it. It can really become a thing where you're, you're deep in the weeds, but. And what, 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 um, what, what bases are you using these days? Well, okay. I have, a, I have my um, signature Brubaker, which is sort of like a jazz bass, um, on steroids, I guess. Like they always call it like some kind of like a altered version of something like on steroids, but but it it's essentially like a five string version of my um Getty Lee jazz bass that I modded. Uh like my my great friend who is no longer with us, Tim Clunan from Callow Hill bases, mm -hmm. he modded my Getty Lee jazz bass that he put in um well originally I had Nord Strands in there, but then I put some Aguilar super singles in there. And then he ended up putting on like better tuners and like a hip shot. And so that's probably my main four string bass. Yep. And I also have like another jazz bass that's like got 60s spacing. Um, that, that Getty Lee's the one in the true fire video, but then I have, I have a, um, another jazz bass that's in that Scott's bass lessons course I've done. Right. Um, that bass is killer. God, I love that bass. My friend, it belonged to my friend and, um, he was, he was living in Brooklyn and I was living in Brooklyn and one night we were going to hang and get dinner. He was like, man, I got this jazz bass, check it out. And I, you know, I was like, I was sitting on his couch playing it. I was like, if you ever want to get rid of this thing, let me know. Cause this bass has some mojo in it. I don't know why mm -hmm. this 2012 Fender American standard J bass is this killing, but it is. And that was a good year for those. But, um, through some circumstances, I ended up getting that bass. Mm. So I've been using that. And that bass is cool. I have a P bass, which um, is one of those American vintage reissues, but it came out in the 90s. So it's now it's a double vintage bass because it's supposed to be a 60s bass, but I think it came out like in 94. So it's like, yep. I don't know if, if there's a phrase for that, but it's like a double vintage. <laughs> so that bass is cool, man. I love I playing it. I think the phrase is just good marketing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um. It's strange. Like I never really fancied myself. It's not that I really thought about not playing one, but the P bass is one of those things. Like it just sort of crept in there, man. Like happens to everybody. I, yeah. And I really like it when it's the right bass, there's nothing better, you know? Um, but then I also have a Strandberg Bowden, which I, I helped them with their promo stuff when it was released. And, and um, I got to beta test the um the prototype because carrie nordstrand is a buddy of mine and he was it was like the november it was like a couple months before we shot the thing but he was like he's like you'd be the right guy to like demo this thing because this is sort of up your alley he's like you want to like check it out and decide i'm like yeah so that base is ridiculous it's it's like playable art as far as i'm concerned like it's yeah. like this chamber thing like i don't know if you know about the 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 enduro neck that strandberg no invented but it's like this ergonomic thing that 
kind of looks like a someone's geometry project, but it it's very comfortable to play. And right. dude, honestly, I I can play so much crazy stuff on that bass; it's unreal. <laughs> so um, yeah, you, you have to kind of keep it keep it in the corner under lock and key. <laughs> yeah, like it's I'll hurt myself if I try to play that stuff on other instruments. Um, then I have a Lakeland fifty five hundred two with Nordstrands. I love that bass, man. That, that thing one is with so the, cool. like the music man, the humbucker at the bridge and the single yep. coil. Yeah. I really think, man, like if you're doing sessions, um, that's, if you need like a wild card bass that you don't, and you don't have any five strings that sort of have that ability to sound like a music man or mm. a J, like it's really, I, I love that bass. Yeah. Kill. Um, and I'm about to do something with Spectre. Like they're going to send me like one of their five strings to check out. I always love those bases, you know. And do you, because you do have, or you did have a Calo, some Calo Hill bases? Yeah, I do. I have um, an OBS yeah. 5, which Tim made for me, and uh, I got that from him in 2012. That's at my mom's house. Um, when Tim died, which is still kind of a hard thing to fathom, mm. um, I didn't really know what to do. Like, I, I don't want to not play it, but when I was moving out here, it's like, I don't know if I should insure this thing or mm -hmm. if it's like one of a kind. And it is one of a kind. Like that bass, you know, however many of those he built, that's really the thing. Um, like, I don't really, I would never really assume the role of like a collector per se, but with that thing, because it's like if something happened to it, I feel really bad. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Like, too, I, too much wrapped up in it, you know? In the moment, when I was packing to move, I just was like, I'll leave it here for now. Um, but the next time I go East and I don't know when that's going to be because I've been sort of staying put, I'm going to bring it back yeah. or I'm going to make sure it's with me. Cause I, it, it that bass is phenomenal. It's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing sounding instrument and it's meant to be played. Um, yeah. It's really, it's really, you know, I mean, there's basses now like Jake Sarek makes amazing basses and he makes a great short scale five. Yeah. Um, like my buddy Evan, he's got one. I know uh, Kevin Scott's got one. I haven't tried Kevin's, but but Evans, I've I've played a bunch because like tried, I haven't tried Kevin's five. I tried his four. Yeah, it's it's the thing. The thing that struck me was like it's it doesn't feel like a short scale in terms of the tension. No, somehow it still has good string tension, and it it doesn't feel too dinky, but it just no. feels fun. Yeah, yeah, they're. They're really cool, man. I mean, there's definitely um, there's definitely something to be said for like a short scale bass like that, especially if it's got a B string, because there is a way to get it to work. And Tim was the first one to do it, man. Like yeah. Tim, Tim, like I mean, there's definitely people who are gonna like probably copy that shit. And I don't know that like Tim foresaw or would have even foreseen that now we're in this short scale. Short scales are kind of cool now. Short scale like, renaissance. <laughs> yeah. But I think there's there's definitely, um, if you record with one, you can see why it works really well. Like, it's it's not hard to see because the way it works, like, it changes where the fundamental is, and it's very, it fills the track really nice. So, yeah, yeah. They're, they're cool. And then not to mention, like, you can do, like, these impossible stretches that <laughs> can't do on other instruments if that's your thing. I don't know. And so you you were never drawn to the kind of you know the MTD Federa Ken Smith kind of side of things. Well, I had a Ken Smith in the '90s, and I didn't. For me, it wasn't the sound I was going for. Like I wanted it to be, but it just didn't. It didn't really do it for me. I think Ken makes amazing instruments. Um, Brubaker's actually helping him with his production now and like yeah. so i had a kevin brubaker i had a brubaker bass that was more like a modern instrument i played that for like eight years okay. um so like the record i made with fuzinski called keith express like that's pretty much the bass i use on there right. it was like a single cutaway so i had my moment with it um i think there was a point when i was really trying to figure out what i was doing on my own i started playing four strings a lot and I just kind of went back to a passive fender and I don't know why I felt like I had to do that, but it felt like a way to sort of reset and um, like just start from nothing and figure out what I want to do with instruments. 
Um, Cause I mean, up until that point, I don't think I really understood the relationship between say like a preamp on a bass and then like the pickups. And what I learned from like, just talking to good builders like Kevin Brubaker or like uh, for a while, Jimmy Coppola was in New York. He moved out here, but he lived a Coppola bases. Mm. Um, it starts with having good pickups that sound good when they're passing. Right. And then if you want to put a preamp in there, that enhances the mix. Yeah. Um, I think no, that's I, one of the things I love about, about the, the F bass is like, well, that that's one of the older ones. So it's got F bass pickups and the F bass right. preamp in it. And when you have, it's a boost only preamp. So volume, yeah. volume, tone, bass, mid, treble. So when you don't have any of the, the bass mid or treble boosted and you switch between active and passive, it sounds exactly the same. Wow. So, so it's, you know, like, it's like zeroed out, like kind of zeroed. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, there's no, there's no volume boost. There's no tonal change. It's exactly the same. So then once you start to do dial in those bass mid treble frequencies, you're kind of yeah. enhancing what's the natural sound of the bass. Right. I love F basses, man. I think they're, they're such well-made instruments and like, you know, like I've played a couple that have blown my mind. Yeah. Like, and I've only played a couple, so they've all blown my mind as well. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, I like MTD. I went to Mike's shop when I first moved to New York, and um, I asked, I mean, like, this is no slight because, he, you know, he's an artist and those things are beautiful. Yeah. But I asked him about artist pricing. He was like, yeah, man, like, here's what it is. I was like, do you have starving artist pricing? Like, you know, it was like. Really- <laughs> do you have bass player prices? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I, but yeah, I love his bases too. I think they're, they're fantastic. Um, Roscoe bases are cool. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Like I, I'm not really like a purist like that, but I think for me, one thing that was really eye opening. Um, one time I was at Aguilar, they have their headquarters in, in Soho and they have two places, but the main place at the time was in Soho. And Dave Boonshoft has like a, uh, I guess it was like a Joe Osborne five string. Mm. I remember I was playing it through one of their rigs and I was like, this is one of the best sounding bases I've ever played. And it really was. And it was passive. Mm. And, and it's just, you know, I don't know, man. I think that's where my head's at with, with a lot of stuff. Like, what does it sound like without any preamp? And then, okay, let's put a preamp in the mix, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think like, I know there's some players that really like, they like the vintage thing. They want to, it's P base only. And I've never really been that kind of player, but I think as someone that's really interested in music and I'm a fan of the records I love in terms of how they sound. Um, I think there's a case to be made for understanding why those bases work really well mm-hmm. and not feeling slighted. If someone asks you to play one, mm-hmm. because you know, Cause I think, I think that's the thing. It's like, they're, they're just tools at the end of the day, you know? Exactly. I mean, I think, you know, um, so that's always been my ethos on, on instruments. It's like, I like the forward thinking stuff. Like that Strandberg bass I have is multi-scale. I can make a case and say that like, there's a reason why those things sound really good. Um, it's not the same scale length as the ding walls. Like, I think the, the B string is like 37 from like where you measure it from. Yep. The the Strandberg is 35. It's like 35 to like 33 and a half, I think. Mm-hmm. But every note has a, it breathes the right way. And it just sounds so musical. Right. So I don't know, man. Like I'm, I'm a fan of, I'm, I don't know. Like I, if there's a way to use that and, and put that on a track and make it work, like I'm down to try, but. I think I do like the simplicity of like the, the early bases and what that, what they do. And that's certainly informed the way I look at modern instruments. Like, cause I think really that's how you know that a really modern forward thinking instrument works because it's got some kind of direct line yeah. to like the past. Yeah. And I can feel that with the Strandberg, even though if you pick it up, it looks like this beautiful kind of, you know, like modern art piece, it really does. I mean, I'm not saying it, it's it's not going to sound like you're not going to sound like Jamerson on it, but it does. There's very intelligent design there, and it makes sense as to why mm. they design it that way. And I, I like what it does. It's to me, it's a musical sound, so I dig it. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
Interesting. Um, I reckon we should maybe wrap it up there. It's been a couple of hours. Don't want to yeah, yeah. take up too much of your time. But if people want to um, check out what you're doing, what you're up to, if they want to get in touch with some lessons or whatever, where can people contact you and find you and, and, and access your art? First and foremost, uh, Instagram, um, which is at Steve Jenkins. Um, and then at, I have at, a website. At bass player. <laughs> what? At averagebassplayer.com. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I'm really glad I was able to get Instagram with just my name. There's a couple Steve Jenkinses in the world. Yeah. And uh, it hasn't always been an easy uh, easy road, man. Like well, I, my, my, um, my partner's name, some name's Jenkins. So I said, oh, I'm interviewing this baseball coach, Steve Jenkins. And she went, oh, my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Um, so then they can go to my website also, stevejenkinsbase.com. And that's got, that's sort of set up like it's a hub. So that'll lead people to, uh, I don't really have a link to Facebook, man. I'm sort of phasing out Facebook, but okay. I'm, I'm on Twitter. Bandcamp? Twitter. I'm on Bandcamp, yeah. Um, stevejenkins.bandcamp.com. Not Spotify. Uh, no, I'm on Spotify. Oh, you are? Yeah. I, um, those records have been out long enough. So I don't, I haven't really felt like it's a bad thing to have them there. Okay. Um, I haven't released anything new on Spotify. So I don't, I haven't really given it much thought as to like how, how I would do that. You know, um, I could see putting a song from a new record on there and just making the full record available someplace else, like just to play hardball. Like, I think that would make sense, but like, it's kind of like with movies, right? Like, yep. You have like direct, direct to video, or like you can you can watch a movie that's in the theater from home, but like it doesn't show up. You have to pay like full price for that, like fourteen bucks or whatever. Yeah. So like I think that's how I'm going to watch the new Bill and Ted movie when it comes out sure. next week. I'm gonna, it'll probably cost like twenty bucks. Whereas you know, which is what it eventually it makes. It. <laughs> What's that? Which is pretty much what it costs to go to the cinema these days. Right. Right. Um, because that's how the film industry is like kind of staying afloat, I guess, like you're trying to make money where they can, but then, you know, eventually that movie ends up on Netflix or like Hulu or something. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of Spotify. Mm. I get it as a consumer and whatever I would say about it in a rant, everybody's already said, um, I think, you know, there's, it's a complicated thing because there's not, there's stuff that that guy said in that interview, like the, the thing I'm talking about, like how people need to make more music more frequently. Like, I don't think if we look at it and, and substitute content for the word music, he's not wrong, but most of the records that we like that really have stood the test of time are not things that necessarily have been made like one every couple of years, like maybe in the seventies where it was like a goal of a band to stay on the road. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you look at, like Kiss's early records, I think they put out like five records in three years, you know, like between like the first album and like Kiss Alive one. Um, Van Halen, same thing. Like if you look like Van Halen one, the Van Halen two, the one, you know, like there, there was a pace that I think really complemented touring, but like if you look at records, I mean, like let's go the other extreme, like uh, Black Messiah, that took 14 years. Um, Chinese democracy. Right. <laughs> Chinese democracy. Um, that's a weird one, man. Yeah, it is. <laughs> do you like it, or do you think it's more? It's it's it it feels weird. It sounds weird. Sometimes I'm like, this is cool. Like there's some cool stuff, and then it just uh, it, yeah. It's 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 a strange. It's a strange album. Yeah, there's some good songs on it, but it's definitely that's an album where you just don't know. I didn't know what to think about when I listened to it. Um, yeah. But I'll say that the other two albums like that, like the D'Angelo's Black Messiah, I really liked it. Yeah. I was cool with it not being like voodoo. Like I felt like it, like there's a couple songs there I don't love, but most of it I really liked. And I felt like this is, I was actually listening to um, last week, I think, because I hadn't really checked it out properly. Then I heard a track on, on local radio and I was like, I should really check out Black Messiah. And listening to it, I was like, do you know what? This makes me, it, it sounds like 
this is probably going to get me a lot of hate mail, but it's it, to me it felt like a bunch of Prince B sides. But yeah. then, oh, because I like Prince B sides, and yeah. if I could write a song that was worthy of being a Prince B side, I'd be very happy. But that that was what I got from it. I had this kind of like garage, very Prince vibe. Yeah. I mean, I think that's not that's not the most controversial take on his music. Like, there's there's people that were far more critical of it, and yep. you know, but I I liked it. Like, I I felt like my, the only expectation I have is that it would just be like a cool record, yeah. and and something I would listen to a few times and re-listen to. It. And since it's been five six years since it came out, like that's still something I listen to. But um, you know, I really liked the last Tool record. I thought that mm-hmm. was great. Um. You know, uh, I don't know, man. Like, I know the songs are long. It's definitely one of those things where, like, I would drive when it first came out, and I would go someplace, and I would think about how long it would take me to get there. And it's like, I can listen to two songs <laughs> off this album, and then I, and I'll know it's almost time for me to check my directions on, on Google Maps. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so I think – you know, there, there's a timelessness to albums that are really important that I don't know that like deadlines really make sense. But I think like if people are going to be critical of anything that guy says, maybe it's kind of not realizing that. But everybody's making stuff, even if they're not albums, you know, like everybody's got things they're mm-hmm. working on and doing. And to that end, I think he's right. You know, maybe, maybe we should look at Spotify more as a social media platform. Yeah. In terms of putting up demos, putting up little skits and ideas and stuff, as opposed to it being more of a shop window, it could be more of a uh, a chance for people to, you know, see the journey. Right. I, it's it's hard because most things that we use are multi-purpose now. You mm-hmm. know, like the computer, for example. Like to me, the computer. This might get me some hate mail that's as important to my existence as a musician as my basis. I think I love making stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, like I love making stuff. I like creating and it's part of it for me. Yeah. Um, So like, you know, um, like I recently got a new computer in the last year. Like I got a new like 2019 iMac. My iMac of 10 years died. And, and um, I was sad about it, man. Like, (laughs) That's pretty good mileage for technology. Yeah. I had to, I had to swap out the hard drive at one point and I just put like an, a super, uh, a, a solid state drive in there. Um, but I was legit sad when it was done. Like it'll still power up and I can still grab stuff off it really quickly, but the screen doesn't stay lit. There's something with like, I don't know. It, it yeah. It's not worth fixing. It was like time, but I felt feelings, man. I was like, this is sad. Like, this is my, you know, this is like the one constant I had in my life besides bases. And, you know, like there was these three different girlfriends I had when I had this, you know what I mean? Like, but also like the records I made on it and the stuff I played on. So, <laughs> so you like, you got like, you know, like holiday snaps with you and your iMac and right. wait for dinner and stuff. <laughs> right. I miss you, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but it, but if you think about all the stuff that we use, like these are all things that their purpose is not just one thing, you mm-hmm. know, like the purpose of Instagram could be a lot of things, yeah. you know, um, the purpose of like the phone even, you know, yeah, like to, to collect personal data and sell it to people. <laughs> exactly. It's a data, it's and a data collection. You and <laughs> right. Yeah. But but, uh, you know, like, to sort of, like, look at it from a lighter standpoint, I remember the first time I actually used it as a phone, I was like, man, this thing sounds amazing. Like, <laughs> the, you know, like, the actual sound of the microphones and the... Yep. Yeah, I don't know. So, I, I don't really know exactly, like, what to say about the streaming model and, like, what people, how they view it. But I know that, like, part of our jobs really isn't to, like, assess business, but I, I don't... I don't know if there's like a great way to look at like how to put stuff out and use it and benefit from it Mm. because it seems like the one thing that was pretty useful, nobody can do right now. 
Like mm-hmm. you could always look and see who's listening to what you're doing and like track where they live. And, you know, I, I was reading about someone that routed a tour that way. Like they could see who's yeah. listening to their stuff. And, but since that's not going on right now, yeah. you know, so yeah, man, but, uh, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm on Spotify. And then I'm talking about Instagram Bandcamp. I'm on Twitter. That's user beware. Cause that's usually where I put all my political stuff and uh, just, you know, it's not that crazy, but yep. political stuff or like I'm, I'm it's usually late, late at night and I'm stoned. And just <laughs> writing nonsense, just trying material out, you know? Awesome. Um, thanks for taking the time to, to do this chat, man. It's been, it's been really, really interesting. Yeah. Thanks for having me, man. Good to talk. Good to finally meet in person or yeah. sort of in person. Yeah, well, virtual person. No, it's it's been cool. So, um, best of luck riding out this this wave of of madness. Um, Thanks, man. Keep creating. I look forward to. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there must be an album coming out soon. Well, there's an album. I don't know when it's going to come out. I'm I'm like writing right now and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully, you know, everyone will get to travel again and we can do it in person and have one of those jams like on some of the other videos yeah. I've seen. Yep, that 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 would be awesome, man. Cool. Well, thanks for having me, man. All right. Take care, Steve. Thanks. Take care. Have a good Bye. one.